Here's 10 reasons on why buying a mini truck is the best decision you could ever make. And then 10 reasons why it's a really bad idea. It's stupid. Don't do it. I mean, go ahead and do it. They're pretty awesome. So we put some new wheels and tires on the truck. And while we talk about the 10 reasons why you do or don't want to get a K-Truck, we'll uh, go through a little install video on these rims and tires. They are massively bigger than the itty bitty wheels that were on it. I love the stance that it gave this truck. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into the pros and cons of owning a little K-Truck. So having owned this truck for about 18 months now, I've put together what I think is a pretty comprehensive list of all the good and the bad. Take a look at these. These are some Volk Racing TR9s, I believe. Uh, if you have seen my Datsun or my Mini, they will look very familiar. Basically the same style wheel that I have on the Z. A little bit different layout. Uh, these have a little bit maybe more of a banana shape and they're a little smoother transitioning to the inside part and these are a multi lug and they have kind of a tapered point there um, but they're basically the same style wheel they call them like a pana sport or wantanabe um, watsonabe whatever it is the reason i didn't go with the ones that were on my z specifically is because they are a little wide these are an eight, 15 by 8 inch rim with a plus 20 offset so these should fit on the mini truck relatively easy. We're hoping, I'm gonna find out. Uh, and then the other thing we did was purchase a set of tires for it. So these are Toyo 195-45-15s. Uh, they should have a little bit of a stretch to them when they get on the rim. Um, I guess with a eight inch rim, you probably wanna go with like a 205 or 225 probably. Uh, this will be a little stretched, but uh, that's okay. I like the style of that. And I think it'll look nice on the truck. And then we have some monster tires back there. Those are the 305 3524s that are going on my Suburban. Uh, I have a bit of a tire issue right now. Yeah, that's uh, no good. So we'll be taking this rim and tire off and getting it to the over to the tire place and uh, get those mounted. So those are Nitto's, Nitto 420s. So they are drastically larger than these 15 inch tires. Yeah. What about performance? I'm gonna put it in the pro category. Even though performance is pretty much non-existent as far as zero to 60 times go, but it does get out of its own way. It's a three-cylinder 660 motor that produces about 35 horsepower in this trim, but it only weighs about 1,400 pounds, so it never really feels too slow when you're driving it. It's torquey and pretty lightweight, and I usually get across the intersection before anybody else has even left the line. 
It'll do its job to get right up to 45 miles an hour, and then after that, it's a very, very slow, slow pace to get to 60. By that point, everybody catches up and passes you. So you won't be winning any street races, but it's a fun little city car, and you can drive around pretty much everywhere without any problem. I've never really even had a problem with it when the truck is loaded up with a bunch of stuff. It still feels about the same, and I've never really noticed any performance drops. Whatever the 35 horsepower are doing, they're doing them right. It does feel maybe slightly top-heavy around corners, so maybe just take it a little easy. And it's always way more fun to drive a slow car fast than a fast car slow. So we're going to get this ticket to the Pro Column. Here's some K-Truck awesomeness. Four 24s, four 15s, and four rims. All in this tiny little car. What about gas mileage? Yeah, lots of it. Gas mileage is great in these things. They're anywhere between 25 and 40 miles per gallon. Now that's under optimal conditions. I usually cruise around 50 or 60 miles per hour. While you're going that fast, your engine is screaming, especially in the four speed version. If you have a fifth gear, maybe not so bad. So you're not very likely to get 40 miles per gallon. On top of that, the gas tank is only about eight to 10 gallons, which means you're gonna be pretty much refilling your tank a lot. I usually go about 150 to 200 miles, and then I go ahead and put about six or seven gallons in the truck. But overall, it's way better than my Suburban. All right, here are the 15s, all mounted and balanced. And let's get them on and replace these 12s. Okay, let's get to the first negative. Safety is pretty much non-existent in this truck. However, the big reason that we never got these in the States is because there's no way they would pass US DOT safety regulations. But after 25 years, the DOT says, Matt, ah, it's an antique. You're on your own. Now, in the dirty south, pretty much every mall crawler is going to want to prove how cool their really big truck is to you. So, you're pretty much the tiniest thing on the road. You might want to stay clear of those if you can. So, they're pretty much going to crush you. Also, keep in mind that your feet are basically right behind the front bumper. So make sure not to skip leg day and do plenty of leg presses and maybe give yourself a fighting chance. There's a lot of steps involved in importing these cars yourself, but they're not that bad. You just have to make sure that everybody's doing their job and then you're staying on top of all the paperwork. Even if you use a broker, sometimes registration or insurance issues will pop up at later dates that you thought were all solved. For example, the import process was pretty simple for me. However, at some point in time, the state of Florida decided to try to suspend my license, saying that my insurance wasn't valid, even though it was. The problem was that the VIN number kept showing up incorrect. Our US systems are looking for a 17-digit VIN, whereas the Japanese system uses 12. So you have to either add zeros before or after, or do something weird like that. So eventually we got that cleared up, but once we did that, the insurance company decided they didn't want to cover right-hand drive cars anymore, so I had to switch to a new insurance company. It wasn't that big of a deal and I was able to get everything sorted out, but I'm always kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop if some paperwork snafu shows up in the future. What about the price? The prices of these are pretty cheap if you import them yourself. You're probably looking at somewhere between three to six thousand dollars for a truck. Now that's before registration and all the US paperwork, and don't forget that Customs is going to charge you 25% tax on the cost of the actual vehicle. So make sure when they send you the invoice that it's separated between the shipping cost and the vehicle price. Even if you buy from a broker, the price is still pretty decent. You're going to pay between six and ten thousand dollars, give or take. But hopefully, you'll avoid most of those paperwork headaches. Alrighty, so there are the new little 15s. It's so beefy on this thing. I dig it. All right, let's get her flat and see how the clearances are. What about resale value? I'd give this a plus also. For the most part, on Facebook Marketplace, you'll see most of these vehicles sell between six and $10,000, like a brokered one. Whether or not they get their asking price, I don't know, but the demand is fairly high for these, and there's kind of a limited supply, so you'll probably do okay. I don't think you'll be losing any money buying one, but just don't expect to retire on the profits. Well, I'm going to give this a pro and a con. These little trucks are the lifeblood of the Japanese economy, especially in the countryside. You think Americans love their truck? Well, that little Japanese farmer does too. From what I've seen, vehicle inspections in Japan are way more strict than they are here in the States. So it's very likely you're going to get a very well-maintained truck. 
Also, a lot of these have pretty low mileage on it. This is 27 years old and it only had 16,000 miles on it when I bought it, which isn't an anomaly, it's pretty common. They're just putting around small villages in rural Japan. There's also a lot that are really high mileage, but most of those are pretty well maintained commercial fleet vehicles. So since they're pretty easy to work on and generally in pretty good mechanical shape, you won't have to do much. However, when you do have to get a part for the car, you're not going to the local parts store to get it. Now everything for these trucks are pretty much available online. There's even a lot of US resellers that stock these parts, but Amazon probably doesn't have what you need. I was able to get some of the simpler stuff for the car at the local auto parts store, like spark plugs, distributor caps, and oil filters. But most major parts are going to require you to be doing a lot of research and scouring the internet. You're going to be doing a lot of eBay searches and a lot of Yahoo auctions Japan. Of course, it's going to add a lot of cost and extra time to your repair bills. So here is the spot that's dangerous of hitting, but I may trim that little itty bitty corner off. Uh, just to give myself a little more room, but I mean, realistically, you should have no problems there. You can see the huge difference in size between these two tires. Way more contact patch with the new ones. What about the rust? Well, let's not forget, Japan is a very cold and rainy island. So between the salt from the seas and the salt from the road, there's a good chance that your car's gonna have some rust. I was lucky mine had pretty minimal rust, all things considered. Just a little bit of surface rust in a few spots. It's actually gotten worse since I've had it here in swampy ass Florida. But be careful for really cheap cars because there's a good chance that they're gonna have flintstone floors and require you to get a tetanus shot before you can drive it. So you may need to do some paint patching and rust repair or at worst case, a whole new paint job. So what about the stereo? Well, unless you're into Japanese AM radio, you're probably going to want to put a stereo in the car. Now, there's no speakers usually in most of these things, so you're going to have to spend a couple bucks for the speakers and something for the radio as well. Not the worst problem, but you will have to spend a few dollars if you want some music in your car. What about comforts and features? I'm going to give this a pro and a con also. You can have one fully loaded with air conditioning, power windows, power locks, automatic transmission, turbo, wheel drive, and more. But most of these are going to come with pretty bare bones. Mine doesn't even have a passenger side visor or a door lock on the passenger side. In all likelihood, you're going to get crank windows, an asthmatic blower, and most likely a manual transmission. Four wheel drive is pretty common on these vehicles, and the dump beds are pretty popular too. But don't expect every bell and whistle that you'd get on a modern car. Tires. Well, tires are pretty hard to find here in the United States. Not many cars run a 12 inch tire. So you're probably going to be digging through a parts bin at a golf cart place. Not to mention they pretty much have zero traction. Forget rainy, even if it's slightly moist outside, you're going to spin first, second, most of the way through third before you get any sort of traction. And take corners in the rain at your own risk. There's no weight back there and that back end just wants to slip all over the place. That's why I install these 15 inch tires. I can still break them loose if I want to, but now I got tons of traction. A lot of people put off-road tires on these as well, but you'll probably have to lift the car to put anything reasonable underneath it. But again, they make tons of lift kits for this car, so that shouldn't be a problem either. The interiors, well, most of them are pretty clapped out. Be prepared to get the duct tape to repair your seats, or order some seat covers, or cash in some favors with your friends that do upholstery work. I sewed up the interior on mine myself and it came out all right, totally passable. Also, be prepared to have very good posture in these vehicles. No gangster lean in here. In most of these things, the seats are not very adjustable, if at all, and they're not super comfy. So, sit up straight, shut up, drive. What about daily drivability? Well, I think it's pretty doable. Unless you're hopping on the highway every day, then I'd maybe stay away. Depending on your insurance, this is more than capable as a daily driver. In fact, I find myself driving it for most short trips I take. I guess it just really depends on where you live and what you need it for. I don't know that I would do a 30 mile commute in it every day, but every once in a while I'd do it. As far as the actual driving experience, it can be a little bumpy when you're driving. But it's very nimble to drive, it has great visibility, and you're sitting so far forward over the wheels that you can see every corner of the car. You can park and drive it with precision. What about security? Well. There's pretty much nothing secure about this car. I imagine it would take about 20 to 30 seconds for a thief to hop in and drive away with it. 
there's no coded keys or alarms or anything like that, so just don't park it in any dark alleys. How about storage? This can be one of the reasons that it makes it difficult to use this as a daily driver, or if you just have to go shopping with it. You really have to plan your path ahead. There's not much room in the cab, so if you go Christmas shopping or to the grocery store, you're not gonna have much space for activities up here, especially if you have a passenger. Yeah, you have a massive bed back there, but if you have to make a second stop anywhere, all of your stuff is gonna just be sitting out in the open. At least in a normal truck, this isn't so bad because it's up a little higher and kind of concealed a little bit better by the sides of the truck. But with this, it's at a really low level and completely within eyesight, which makes it easy to grab. Now, some of these little trucks have little boxes underneath the bed where you can store extra goodies, but this one doesn't have it. You're still not storing any overhead luggage in there or anything. What about utility? Well, this is where the K-Truck shines. That bed back there is pretty massive. For as tiny as this truck is, it's all bed. I was building a deck for my house and I had the whole thing in the back of the truck once. I can almost fit my Mini Cooper in it. The load capacity is about 700 pounds, which isn't much, but it doesn't affect the driving ability of the car at all, even loaded with that much weight in it. The size of the bed is about five by seven, but it's flat, there's no wheel arches in there. It's almost as big as my dad's F-150 truck. Once you fold down the sides of the bed, you have almost infinite storage. That doesn't have a tow hitch, but you can get a little adapter bumper for it. I wouldn't go pulling anything crazy, maybe a jet ski or two, or just a small trailer. This is how I pick up the garbage. And here's the number 10 positive reason. This truck puts a smile on everyone's face. It's fun for everyone. Well, except for the douchebag in the Mustang that's just trying to get past me. Every time I see it, I just have to smile and laugh. It's small, easy to drive, easy to park. It's quick enough when you're just shooting around the city. Or you can take it for some 4x4 action. These things are pretty capable four-wheel drive vehicles. Well, that's about it. That's my list of 10 pros and cons for these little mini trucks. Let me know in the comments if you disagree with anything that I said or, or if I missed anything. Overall, they're great little vehicles despite any of the drawbacks that I mentioned. However, after making this list, it got me thinking. I think I can fix a bunch of these issues by buying a van. This is Ao Keiru, Keiru's big little brother. He's a 1996 Suzuki Every, and he's on a boat on his way here right now. He's basically the exact same platform as a carry, except that he's a van. So the back area is all covered up, so that solves one problem. He's also got an automatic transmission, which I'm not crazy about, but it'll fix my wife complaining that she can't drive it. And he's got air conditioning, power windows, power locks, and it's a turbo. So please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and you'll see the process when we go to pick up this van from Jacksonville. There's a few steps that we didn't talk about when we brought in the K-Truck, and we'll cover those in that video. Oh yeah, one more thing. Here's one of the cons that I forgot. drive throughs You gotta go through those backwards. Thanks again, and see you next time.